George, I'd love to start off by sort of diving into your personal relationship with music. So when was it in your career that you really made the decision that it's what you wanted to pursue? And when did you figure out that film scoring was the route for you? Well, um, I didn't... Uh... I didn't really make a conscious decision. It, it, I mean, in the sense that uh, I began my writing um, in sort of a scores, as it were. I began writing in the theatre. And it was really because I'd written incidental music for plays in London. And um, then one of the directors I worked for made something for the a, you know, a film for television and he asked me to do that. And then the producer of that asked me to do other things. And one of those other things was directed by Stephen Frears who asked me to do a film. And so I kind of, in a way, I, I, I my, my musical career began more with arranging and orchestrating for people. And then, and then I, I just started writing things and, very, very small things, and then, then it sort of escalated from there. So I, I think, really, I owe my career, in fact, to the success of the people I worked for because, it, you know, they did good things and therefore worked more and, and moved into different sort of uh, arenas. And it was that that led me into, into doing films, really. Yeah. So some of your most beautiful writing is in documentaries like Planet Earth and Blue Planet. Those were released quite a ways back, but we still talk about them. And they're still a sort of prime example of the way in which imagery and music can sort of go together to just really tell stories. Um, so can you talk a bit about how you actually got involved with BBC and scoring those documentaries and your process of translating those incredible, beautiful images into a musical language? Well, <clears throat> um my you, um i did one series uh for um way back uh called the trials of life which was one of the series <clears throat> that david attenborough made of his own he has like a series of of life um uh whatever you call it labeled kind of documentaries so life in the undergrowth you know the life of <clears throat> reptiles or whatever and i um and he did one called the trials of life and um and i did that and there was a producer of one of the or two or three of the episodes a director called alistair fothergill and he asked me to do <clears throat> a couple of other things and they were quite small scale and um and I didn't, to be honest, take them very seriously because um, when, when the, if you look back at them, I mean, it's interesting to look at them now because, because kind of historical, but when you look back at them, they would have, they were all about animal behavior, nearly always about animal behavior. And th because they didn't have the resources, they, and the animals couldn't be directed as it were, they the sequences were very, very short. So you'd have animal behavior that was maybe, you know, 20 seconds long. And so it, it, the music was sort of had a really kind of um, small scale kind of ambition because there was no de developed narrative. And I, I had sort of left, you know, I did them as a kind of, for, I did them for a little bit. And then I, carried on doing films and I was doing a film or about to start a film in, 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 uh, Los Angeles. And he, he called me up, Alistair called me up and said, I wanted to, you, you to do this series I've done or I'm doing at the moment. And, um, I said, well, I'm really busy doing. So. And he said, well, uh, let me tell you about it anyway. So he said, he said, it's called the blue planet. And it's the first complete natural history of the oceans. And I said, well, you know, and I <laughs> thought about it. And I thought, well, actually, the Blue Planet is such a brilliant title. And it's such an amazing thing to do. And then he told me that they'd filmed for five years and they'd got these hugely long stories and everything. And he wanted a big orchestral score. And so I said, 
Okay. And I, I think that it was the key to, the, to doing them in the first place and the key to scoring the images was because th for the first time ever, they had they had filmed complete stories like like stories although we couldn't relate to the creatures because they're all underwater we could relate to the the stories that were being told about them and and it made them sort of somehow for me it brought them made them so vivid and so i in a way just scored them as though i was scoring a film in the old fashioned way you know and um and I think I've had a special relationship with with those images uh, because they are so um, what's the word? They're sort of innocent. Uh, they're unself conscious. The 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 way the things that you see are not repeatable or directable. They are things that are just the wonders in a way of of the world we live in. And because of that you can respond to them musically without feeling that you're, you know, that there's any danger of you being either cynical or overindulgent or sentimental or, you know, a lot of those things that we worry about when f scoring films because of the tone of the film just disappear and you can just respond in a very natural way. And I think it works for all kinds of people. I was very lucky to do those, you know. I don't want to do them forever. I, I mean, I'm glad the way that's over for me. But, but, um, um, but, but I think everybody who, can, who writes, you know, you're a, a writer, I know. You can, you can find, it, there's so much to find in the material that's really inspiring and makes you do things in a free way. You know, you feel kind of free to do it. And I am quite curious about these specific things that you did, um, like Blue Planet and like Planet Earth, because the scope of them are, is, of course, just massive. I mean, there's so much. It's, as you said, they're very human stories. But in terms of the scope, I mean, all the different sequences, you know, all around the world. So I'm curious from your sort of composer perspective, you know, how important were these in terms of you building your own musical voice and you experimenting and um, sort of trying to expand your orchestral palette and you know how important were these projects for you and for your career? <laughs> well, they were they were very important and and um, and I think partially they became more important because they developed in a way that I hadn't foreseen. So, for example, I did the Blue Planet and. Nobody had any idea that the Blue Planet would have the impact that it had. And it had a sp particularly big impact, I think, because in uh, the UK, it was released, the very first episode was broadcast the day after the um, disaster of 9-11. And the, the, they, just, they were debating whether they should broadcast it. And in the end, they they did broadcast it. It was a it was a tremendously uh, sort of I don't know epic day it seemed, and it got a hugely wide audience, which these things had never had before. As a result of that, because I used to play the stuff back in my studio on a big screen for Alistair and the other directors, I, I said to them, you know, you ought to really make a film of the blue planet like a cinema experience because it's so terrific on the big screen and um they said well you know we don't uh and uh and co co uh, sort of at the same time they the the person who worked for the bbc records at that time jane carter who r ran bbc records asked me if i would do a concert of the music to the pictures and so I did, I did put one together with her help. We put it together, this thing, and I played a concert with the pictures. No, no narr narration, just the pictures and the music. And it, it, as a result of that, or partially as a result of that, they did decide to make a film. Um, and, the, the, and I rescored the film. And for that, I had to. I had the incredible opportunity of working with the Berlin Philharmonic, who had never recorded a film score in in their history. And every single time, you know, whether it was from the 
series to the concert or from the concert to the film and then going to the Philharmonie in Berlin and conducting the, the Berlin Phil. And then Planet Earth came along and the same process happened and then more concerts and more of this. That actually the, the, the way that I thought about the music became more and more informed by, the, as it were, the musical, <laughs> what you described, you know, what I was trying to do with the music as well as just simply scoring a TV documentary. And I think it was that expanse that really helped me um, to sort of develop a language. I think it, it has its own little language that that those documentaries, the, the the tonal language that I developed. You know, it's not it's not contemporary music. Um, it's not it 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 very much not to contemporary music, but it has a little it has a few little trademark things about it which i i i did develop and and from in my head and in my heart as it were they they belong to that world and those those films absolutely and then of course in between all these various documentary series you have this sort of massive wealth of films that you've scored you know in the 90s going into the 2000s everything from you know groundhog day and there's just so many different genres and so many different films that you've sort of went into and explored so i'm curious in terms of of course story i would assume it's very similar to these documentary series but in terms of just this the scale of the project the different um, process how do you find the difference between scoring films versus scoring documentaries there are similarities um, as well as differences and um, one of the nicest things that um, that Alistair Fothergill ever said to me was that he said when you score the documentaries it, when we're in the studio and the orchestra's playing is is the time when I most feel like I felt when I was shooting the sequence, the, the, you know, the kind of, that it gives back the sort of excitement or whatever, or the mystery or the, whatever. And, um, and I suppose that that would lead one to say, which, you know, is a very generous thing for him to say, but uh, we, he was probably just being nice, <laughs> but, but, well, you know, <laughs> but what, but anyway, he, the, the, but the point, the bigger point is, is that when you're scoring a film, any film, what you're trying to do with the music is, is to present, help to present the film in the way that the filmmaker wants the film to be received. And in that sense, they're similar, but why they're different, I suppose, is because, um, with, with the documentary, you're, you, in a way you 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 have perhaps a higher degree of authorship um in film i think you have the responsibility in film is 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 slightly different because um because in the sense that it's a a combined creative effort there are so many more elements that you have to be aware of, and the principal one being that you, whatever you do, you have to you have to enhance performance. Whereas the documentary, you don't have to enhance performance. So if you want to say something in a documentary, you can. Um, uh, I think that a lot of the characterization in documentaries people say do you characterize animals for example you know well you don't really characterize animals um uh i don't think i think it, what characterizes them is the camera you know the camera selects and it's the camera's selection that makes you characterize or not the animal or the action and I think for that reason that the the relationship with the image is very very crucial whereas in the film that process is 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 in a way comes later because of the process of editing and editing for performance and so your 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 relationship with the film is in a way a much it it's further down the line than it would be 
somehow with a with a documentary. I, that probably doesn't make any sense at all, but that's yeah. I mean, so I feel that somehow the documentary says to you, "Here are these images," and you watch the images. And of course, you know the rhythm of the cutting is important, but it's not the same as when you when you're on the receiving end of something that you get a first class editor working on and that the way that they've nuanced, you know, performances and timing of performances and things like that. And I think it's the, you know, the devil's in the detail. So you, so that's how you get into films more. And then if then that sort of emerges into something that is also has a sort of a life of its own too, then that's a bonus, of course. But but you know your principal job is a much more, perhaps a much, a little bit further down the line, more detailed kind of experience. Absolutely, thing. yeah. So before we jump forward to a little film that came out recently called Cold Pursuit yeah. um, with Liam Neeson, uh, great, great, really, really fun, exciting film. I do want to touch upon one stepping stone in your career up to that point that for me has really been one of my personal favorite scores of yours, and um, it's called Lady in the Van. Um, and it's uh, for me, I think it's this beautiful sort of classical sounding score. Um, and it just has a lot of, to me, it has a lot of heart to it. So I'm curious about your process working on that film and what the experience was like. And can you just talk a bit about that specific yeah, project? Yeah, I can. I mean, I can talk about the lady in the van all night because, because, um, for, t for many reasons, really. One is that um, it was directed by Nicholas Heitner, who I've, I've done all his films, um, uh, the films he's made, like The Man is King George, The Crucible, The Object of My Affection, The History Boys. The, I, I've done all the films he's made. And, um, <clears throat> and also, I've done a lot of uh, film and theater of uh, material written by Alan Bennett. And so the... Those are two important reasons why, first of all, I did the film. And and secondly, I have a history of working with them both. But the third thing is, is that, um, which in a way shouldn't have affected anything, but I actually knew, I, 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 I remember the lady in the van. I met her a couple of times. Before, and she was a very, you know, one-off uh, character, a wonderful character. Uh, uh, sort of abrasive character uh, exactly in a way like Maggie Smith plays in the film but uh, but she had this uh, secret life you know she had this which which when Alan wrote a stage play about her wasn't in the play but it had always it had always been something that um, that had interested me and ha and interested him when he came to write the film, which is that as a girl, before she had a breakdown and then went into a nunnery and, and, and then became mentally unwell, um, she had been an exceptionally gifted pianist and had been a pupil of, of Corto, who was a Swiss-French pianist uh, with a, a huge reputation and... Um, particularly renowned for playing Chopin. And so, and so in the film, there was this idea that when there were flashbacks, that it would flash back to her as a young girl um, playing uh, concerts. And um, I think that in a way drove, again, you know, when you mentioned the sort of the classical quality to the score, I think that's what, what drove it. The heart of it came um, from ch basically choosing the slow movement of the first piano concerto by Chopin, and then uh, and then sort of other things, you know, that I listened to, you know, Beethoven trios and bits and bobs of various things that I listened to that that, and I thought, well, what I should do is I should make this score kind of like the music that she would know. So whether, you know, even when it became more avant-garde, that it was avant-garde in a kind of late 50s, early 60s way, <laughs> what I did, was, um, because that was the sort of avant-garde. And all the time I was driven by this thought, oh, well, that's what she would hear, you know, she would hear this 
you know, the chamber music or the big orchestral things or whatever. That's what she would listen to. So Yeah. And the score and the film just have so much heart, but I you know, watching it for the first time, I couldn't help but notice how much fun it looked like to to create the musical score because it again it is just so multidimensional. So now we're jumping forward um to the film Cold Pursuit, which yeah. is a remake of the original film directed by Hans Peter Moland. Um mm-hmm. and um he also directed the the new one as well. And it is such a massively interesting but fun, thrilling sort of adventure. And it's different than anything that's sort of out there, which is why it is is so fascinating. So I'm curious about your sort of musical approach, because, again, it is so specific, and I don't think there's been anything like it written. So I'm curious about how you approached navigating this narrative with, with the director and what some of your first conversations were like. Well, the, um, I came... Uh, to it because um, a music editor that I work with, Graham Sutton, had had put in the temp when he was working with Hans Petter, he put in the temp some things of mine. And when they were sort of thinking about the music, uh, he said, well, you, sh- you, sh- what? He said, you may as well have a chat with, um, with George. So I met him and, and, and he, and he was, um, he very, he very nice and very specific about. He, he mentioned a score that I'd done for a film for a, a, the the um, English uh, filmmaker Ken Loach, who I work for quite a lot, and he he particularly liked one. He mentioned one of these films, and when we so we started talking about this film, which um, which uh, and and he he was very interested in in my response irrespective of what my response was so he wasn't prescriptive at all he just said you know we've got things here we've got th- you know we put in this we put in that we tried this we tried that you know we kind of like this and i think he said but you should just go away and think about what you think you might do and i when i saw it um i i loved it i have to say i think it's a really really smart film and and he you know it's got such a kind of like it's so well judged the kind of the the tongue-in-cheek of it and all of that and I thought when I went away and I thought about it I it it reminded me it's it just occurred to me that I ought to um go and (laughs) just have a chat with with my nephew by marriage who is a who's a record producer called Dan Carey and he he does a lot of production and remixing and things like that but one of the things that he he uh, has and is very very um expert at using is um a, a little known um bit of electronic kit called a swarmatron do you know what that is Okay, well, you can look it up, but I mean, the, the Swarmatron is 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 basically a bank of oscillators, which which one can do kind of really interesting things with harmonically, and and um, and so I went to see him, and I we just messed around, you know, with what the Str- Swarmatron did and various things, and I took them back then over to see Hans Petter. And I said, look, just somehow to me, there's a kind of a, there's a kind of um, sort of (laughs) electronic analogy purity, kind of undressed up, you know, not, not washy pads and sort of omnisphere and, you know, all of those kind of highly developed things, but just like sound, like basic, sounds you know like from a <clears throat> an old prophet or a jupiter sound and the swarmatron and thing and i played him those things and he said yeah no i really um i he loved them so so with that i then um he went off to shoot another movie actually and then i i went back and worked with dan a lot and then we went into to air and mixed and and kept the same um protocols all the time you know we used um analog you know as long as we could, compressors and old pool techs and Fairchilds and all that, and um, it was really, really interesting to do and f- and fun to do. And then I just added two or three solo instruments and um, a couple of shifts with a string group, and 
basically that that was it and uh, it was all it was all um and then which was really interesting <coughs> things that i had written because we had worked out a plan for the film he quite often moved to other places so he so hans petter moland is one of those people for whom the film is never finished until the day he do you know what i'm saying he 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 keeps looking at it again and saying, actually, I wonder if it'd be quite funny if, and he does something. Or I wonder, actually, it would be much darker if I, and he does something. And and in those cases, he quite often moved a, another music cue into a different position. Or um, And, and I, at first I was kind of like, well, hang on a minute, because, you know, <laughs> One doesn't really, you know, you spend a lot of time on the architecture, so you don't really want that going on. But in fact, with him, I didn't mind because his his um, his focus on the film, and in a way, his eye on the film was so unerringly good and witty. And and, and I think that is that is what makes the film work so well. Is that so many other films that have tried to bend genres, it ends up getting unbalanced, and you don't know which direction it's going. But in this film, it seems like you know the director, and you know because of the great performances by people like Liam Neeson, and of course the score, it seems like there's always this sense of control. So yeah. there's always this fine balance between the drama and the, the you know the sort of satirical black comedy. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's it's a great balance. Yeah, I, no, I agree with you. I think, I, and I felt really, really lucky to have um, to have had the chance to work on it. So, um, you know. So, so for good. my for my last question, yeah, um, I am curious from your perspective. I'm sure that you've had the chance to sort of look around at you know, the modern state of the industry. And there's a lot of people trying to come up and get into the industry, and there's so much content being made, whether it's for film or for TV or for Netflix. You know, there's yeah. so many different platforms. I'm curious from your perspective, um, and you've worked in the industry for decades, what your piece of advice would be for an aspiring composer wanting to pursue this as a living? I would say <clears throat> musical diversity. I think that there is so much great stuff now out there. There is so much interesting music being written and experimented with. And I think the only trap of a uh, film music becoming more and more uh, widely practiced and, and, and in a way, you know, widely available, a lot of people coming into the industry, like you say, I think is always for young people coming through to remember that music was there before film was there. And when filmmakers used music in the first place, the reason they did was because they wanted a bit of what music had. You know, they wanted music to add something to their film. And therefore, if you look outside <laughs> to what's going on, or you come from a sort of a musical background, and you do your music, and you can bring that to film, always then your voice will be in what you do. And that's important. Whereas if you listen too much to what's being done in other films, then it will turn in on itself more and more and then the musical diversity and richness won't flourish in the same way so i think that that's the most important you know to always keep always remember that you're a musician first that's a wonderful piece of advice george fenton thank you so much for taking the time yeah, everyone cold pursuit is in theaters and you guys can also check out the soundtrack uh, it's great definitely recommend it and again thanks so much you're welcome Cheers. Bye. Yeah, Bye. Cheers to you.